Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar for the Global Wind Report for 2022. It's an exceptionally exciting day for the team here at GWIC and wherever you are in the world, it's, uh, oh, we're very happy to have you here. My name's Stuart Mullen, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Global Wind Energy Council. Um, and we've, before we start today, I'd like to thank our sponsors of the report, uh, Iberdrola, who also have uh, graciously lent us the, this fabulous auditorium for the launch of this webinar. Uh, also, the Wind Energy Hamburg and Lincoln Electric, and the associate sponsors of Harting, Goldwind, Windesco, Henkel, Kavakian, NAS, uh, Fearcroft, SSE Renewables, and Textrom. Uh, for those people in the webinar, we have a couple of housekeeping rules. So when you're joining, um, we're going to have a Q&A session. So please, if you've got questions during the webinar, please put them into the chat and we'll try to, we'll be uh, endeavor to get to as many of those as possible throughout the course of the day. Uh, this webinar will be also, apart from in the Zoom meeting, we'll be also um, live streaming at, on uh, YouTube and um, LinkedIn Live. So there's, if there's, if anything, if you happen to drop out of the Zoom, you can also try some other channels today. So we're going global in this and we're very happy for you to join. So welcome wherever you are once again. I will hand over now to the CEO of uh, the Global Wind Energy Council, Mr. Ben Backwell, to uh, come with his preliminary remark or his opening remarks. Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart, and uh, thank you um, to Iberdrola for hosting us um, here and um, to um, Javier Viteri, who you will hear from in a, in a second. Um, it really is um, a very exciting moment for us at GWEC. This is by far the kind of most comprehensive and the deepest um, report that we've ever written. And I want, I want to extend um, a special thanks to the uh, lead authors of the report, um, Joyce Lee and Feng. Zhao, who you will hear from um, later. We've tried to go beyond just giving a snapshot of the market and really dig into deeply um, some of the challenges um, that the industry is facing right now, but also the longer term challenges which the wind industry will face as we scale up uh, to meet the um, obligations and the ex expectations of a net zero um, world. Um, now, what's, what's really striking in this situation is, in a way, the, the kind of mismatch between um, what we need to achieve, um, and I think what everybody understands we need to achieve as an industry and more widely in the renewables industry, um, and, uh, and our ability to be able to progress um, on the ground. Um, the expectations of you know, net zero, where the you know, vast majority of countries have signed up for long-term carbon emissions uh, reductions uh, and the scenarios which the international um, agencies like IEA and IRENA have set out um, really require us to be, um, as an industry, around 10 times uh, bigger in terms of cumulative installations by the time we get to 2050. And that requires a very steady and um, rapid um, acceleration um, of installations where we should be getting to something like um, 400 um, gigawatts of annual um, installations um, a year. And, and we are um, in a situation where the possibilities and the opportunities for growth uh, are almost limitless. I mean, all of, all of our companies are seeing you know, a world of opportunity, of new deals, um, of new interests from governments and, and geographies. Um, and we're very, very confident that um, in the next if three or four years time, we're going to see a significant um, acceleration um, in demand. But in a way, just to look at to look at where we are right now. Um, so we had the second biggest year um, in history for the wind um, industry, which is uh, quite an achievement. It's very close to the record year we had in 2020. It's it's quite an achievement. We pushed through COVID and all the problems and the you know the bottlenecks and restrictions, and we still managed to install something like 94 gigawatts, which is a, you know, a pretty um, healthy level. And it was also a record year for offshore with this extraordinary 21 gigawatts of offshore wind. Um, so in short, um, not a bad year at all, um, but one which still falls short of our uh, very um, you know, uh, uh, optimistic 
and uh, important expectations as an industry and, and I think as a world. So it's, it's about how do we accelerate and how do we make sure that short-term policy matches to long-term policy. And I'd, I'd just like to name a, a few issues and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give the floor um, to, 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 to Javier. Um, first of all, are we serious collectively about solving the challenges? And, and, the, and the first one is permitting, which as an industry we've been talking about for years, um, uh, as companies, as trade associations, and there is a, a really much um, keener sense amongst governments that this is an issue, that it is a problem, and that urgent measures need to be taken. Um, but we need to see it, and we need to see real action on the ground. Um, many, many times we see countries that simply um, increase their targets, which is great, but they don't actually um, have um, installations on the ground that, that match those targets. And there's, there's many, many countries which are underperforming in terms of installations, but which have very healthy and big targets. There's, there's no point just having what I, what I call target inflation of just creating bigger and bigger targets if we're not going to let uh, companies uh, build that capacity. So I think that's, that's number one is, you know, we need to solve the permitting issue. Um, the second one is, um, there's no point, you know, drip feeding capacity into a market which needs much, much more capacity. You know, there's no point holding um, occasional auctions or small auctions and then creating a kind of overheated uh, market um, when, in fact, we need a lot more auctioning. We need a lot more investment um, to, uh, to flow. Um, and, I, and I think, as people have realised, there's actually a massive overhang of investment uh, wanting to come into this sector, but which is not able to deploy because the projects um, are not developing fast enough or there's not enough projects available. So the money's not a problem here. Uh, what's the problem is the ability to be able to advance um, on the ground. And then I think just finally, I mean, we really, it's really important now for politicians um, to give the right signals um, and to you know, really be consistent, to not uh, you know, give in to kind of short term um, considerations, to really be honest um, and principled about where we need to go. We know, and you can see in the, in the, quite a lot of the report is about some of these midterm challenges. We know um, not everything will be easy. We know there may be social challenges, but I think if we work together between governments and the industry and communities, we can um, uh, overcome those challenges. But it's very, very important that politicians uh, give consistent uh, messages. And, and then just finally, um, obviously we are all very shocked by the um, tragic uh, 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 Russian invasion of um, Ukraine um, and you know, all of us in, in the, the wind industry um, would like to see a peaceful outcome um, uh, as soon as possible. Um, but we also now see uh, just how important the question of energy security is. I mean, we have, as an industry have been talking about it actually for, for many years about not um, you know, being held hostage to uh, fossil fuels um, or, 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 or other uh, commodities which are, are now being used um, as a weapon, and also to get away from a world where fossil fuel uh, volatility um, can you know, really hurt uh, consumers and economies, as we've been seeing now building for the last um, year and a half, and now is even uh, more extreme uh, because of the um, invasion of Ukraine. So we, you know, we really need to you know, be consistent, carry out the energy transition, and once and for all, um, uh, stop being uh, hostage uh, to this very volatile um, um, form of energy. So um, I'll leave it there and hand over to Xavier uh, Biteri. Thank you. What? Push it hard. Okay, okay, all right. All right. Okay. Sorry for these technical issues. Okay, Ben, thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank uh, not only you, but all your team, all the GWEC team. I think uh, you have done a very good uh, work. Uh, in this annual report that you have been able to put uh, together. And also I want to thank uh, all of you for choosing Bilbao. I mean, you know, Bilbao is the hometown of Iberdola, uh, one of the main wind hubs in Spain to host this uh, launch. In the same way, I think I would like to thank everyone in this uh, webinar and all the members of the industry, because again, I mean, following your, your words, then I think we have hit another good year and, uh, for, for, for the wind sector. Okay? I think the figures uh, that will be presented sometime later will illustrate clearly that we are moving in the, in the right direction. And also that what uh, the work, uh, crucial role in supporting wind development around the world and helping to unveil new opportunities and paving the way is being very fruitful. 
But uh, as you mentioned, despite all of our efforts, I think that we still we need to keep moving at pace if we want to deliver the objectives that are being set worldwide to reach the path to zero carbon. The new report of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change stated that the Earth is already 1.1 degrees warmer than before in industrialization. This means uh, that we need uh, to push harder to be able to double our speed to achieve the goals on the time and respond to the climate uh, emergency. I firmly believe that the transition to a carbon neutral economy by 2050 is uh, technologically possible, economically feasible and socially necessary. And especially electrification with renewables should act as a lever for global uh, change as the most cost efficient way to decarbonize the economy. More than ever, actions cannot be delayed. The latest and tragic and sad geopolitical event that you referred to have put a spotlight on the urgent need to reinforce security of supply, reduce energy dependence, and shield against market disruptions caused by high prices. Again, this can only be achieved with a massive deployment of wind as a key and steady part of the renewable mix. It looks like the wind industry is doing its part, ready and committed to step up. However, many policy barriers must be lifted. Permitting is the main, as you mentioned, roadblock hindering our progress. Hence, overcoming permitting, motornecks should be a priority by all the countries and policymakers. But uh, as all of you know, a massive deployment of wind requires huge levels of investment, and this requires clear and stable regulatory frameworks as well. Any unexpected changes on rules, causes, uncertainty, and will result in a reduction in the appetite to deploy new renewable capacity. Policy is due, critical for the industry, and needs to be consistent and progressive in its thinking. Together with the innovation in supply, it's also paramount to create an environment for an optimal grid planning and dimension. In these regards, investment should also be directed towards smart grids, transmission, and distribution networks, as well as in energy storage, both essential infrastructures for the integration of the energy in the systems and bringing renewables energy to users. Last, but certainly not least, we must also work on building a strong and sustainable supply chain that will give the industry a robust platform to support expansion and the high production volumes it requires. Some regions, as all of you know, are promoting local and regional supply chain hubs, sometimes links to new opportunities at technological level. These initiatives will reduce geopolitical risk and improve energy security, as well as creating jobs uh, and economic growth for those regions. This is the core that underpins the industry. And, it's, and it, it is of extreme importance to strengthen every link of the supply chain from design to manufacturing and to equipment. A holistic approach is the essence. The goals are set and clear. Now it is time to work together as an industry and focus our efforts in the same direction. And to finish, just uh, again, thanks uh, once again to everyone in the report launch and for bringing all this forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. There you go. Thank you. So now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Feng Zhao, uh, the head of strategy for GWIC. So Feng, come and do your presentation, please. Uh, also, if you again, if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat. There'll also be a link to download the report in the chat as well. So please keep your eye on what's happening in the chat, and we'll make sure that we update you as as we go along. Huang. Um, thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Javier, um, to give an excellent uh, opening remarks. And now I'm going to um, 
present the key findings uh, from the data side of this report. Uh, as Ben already indicated, uh, last year, 2021, uh, was the second best year for the wind industry. And we have 193.6 gigawatts of the new wind power installed uh, worldwide. It's only 1.8 person trailing behind the record year 2020. Uh, this is clear sign of the incredible resilience of the wind industry. Um, also the upward um, trajectory of the growth. Uh, 2020, we have more than 90, uh, 95 gigawatts installed as mainly due to the strong growth in China due to the cut off the fitting tariffs. So we have in China alone, more than 50 gigawatts of onshore. Uh, last year, the onshore winds dropped in China, but still we make up 93 gigawatt new installation. That's really incredible. And this brings the total global uh, installation capacity to 837 gigawatt, 12.4% um, um, increase compared with uh, the previous year. Uh, looking at the looking at the growth uh, by region, and uh, it's also incredible. We saw all the region increase new capacity last year, apart from two regions, Asia and uh, North America, Europe, North America, Africa, and Middle East, also Pacific region as record year in 2021. Uh, the YOY growth rate. As you can see on the slide, 1927, 120, and 58% respectively. That's a remarkable growth. However, we do recall uh, slow growth in Asia and North America, um, mainly due to the top two wind power market uh, drops last year, mainly um, focused on the onshore. Uh, the, the risk bar. And the first one on the left side, that's China. We can see the onshore wind installation in China um, declined nearly 20 gigawatts. Uh, in the United States, we record four gigawatt uh, decrease. It's mainly due to the impact of the supply chain um, COVID associate uh, challenge um, in the United States. But again, uh, you can see the offshore wind uh, we on the right side, we have the blue bar, and this is more than 14 gigawatts increase. That's quite uh, significant. In terms of onshore wind, uh, last year, 72.5 gigawatts uh, was installed. The top five market uh, campaign make up 75.1% of global installation compared with previous year. That's 5.5% uh, lower. Um, but again, the key driver, uh, key um, reasons is due to the slowdown of the onshore wind in the world's two largest market, China, United States. Um, after uh, China, United States, uh, we have Brazil as the top three uh, market, number three in, in new installation, mainly due to the free PPA market is very active uh, last year. We record nearly four gigawatts of new installation in this market, uh, followed up by Vietnam. In Vietnam, we have the similar drivers uh, recorded in China uh, it's due to the cut off the fitting tariff. Uh, so, as we all know, the first of November uh, was the cut off date for fitting tariff in Vietnam. That's why we record 74, gig, uh, 74 projects reach the COD by the deadline. Um, so again, uh, onshore wind, uh, 72.5 gigawatts, uh, slows, slower than the previous year. But again, uh, in terms of historical information, that remains the second best year for onshore. Offshore, as Ben already mentioned, more than 21 gigawatts installed, grid connected worldwide. That's three times what we reported a year ago. Very impressive. 
and account for 22.5 of global new information in 2021. The key driver for the new growth last year is China, as you can see from the bar chart. Um, more than 80% of the new information from one single market. These new numbers, I think, beyond all the imagination and expect, uh, expectation. Um, 16.7 gigawatts, a great connection in China, bring the cumulative information to 27.7 gigawatts, almost the same level like we have today here in Europe. It took three decades for Europe to achieve the same level of information. So this is absolutely uh, insane. I mean, how strong the supply had to be in order to build such a high level of the new information uh, in one year. Number two marks that's the UK, uh, thanks for the commissioning of the project from CFD2. Uh, and follow up, uh, we have Denmark, Netherlands, and number four, and number three, and number four market in new information. And also we have uh, Vietnam on the list again for the same reason due to the cut of fitting power. Uh, we, we also report uh, information in Taiwan. Unfortunately, the commi commission capacity is much lower than expected. Uh, the reason is due to COVID associate uh, disruption. Uh, on the supply chain. Uh, looking at the next five years uh, outlook, that's also my last uh, takeaway from this report, where we can see the CAGA, the compound average growth rate for the next five years. Uh, we report 6.6 .6 per year, uh, percent per year for the next five years. Um, the key drivers, um, I think we all know uh, there is great momentum in terms of uh, the commitment on mix zero across the global, which uh, posed it when to play a vital role in accelerating the global energy transition. And coupled with the recent uh, energy concern triggered by Russia's uh, evasion of Ukraine, I think the midterm outlook for when in general across the global looks uh, really good. And the current Business as usual market outlook indicates that for onshore wind for the next five years, we're going to have 6.1% of cargo growth rate uh, with the average annual information at the level of 93.3. That's close to the single year information for 2021. So you can see uh, the growth for onshore is quite strong. And looking at the offshore, the next five years cargo 8.3. Remember, we have 21 gigawatts in 2021. I mean, if you have the very strong best year and looking at the next five years still have nearly 10% growth rate, that's incredible. The, the average growth rate uh, inflation for offshore wind in the next five years, that's 18.1. This means by 2026, the new offshore wind inflation are going to account for nearly 25% of the new information. So this is our um, five years outlook based on the policy, the current policy. Uh, we are pretty sure that uh, we are going to upgrade our market outlook in our Q3, market, market outlook uh, in September. It's mainly due to the current market design, market energy reform we have. For example, here in Europe, we have Renew uh, Euro, uh, EU, um, initiative and across the global, we saw the uh, commitment made earlier uh, last week, for example, in Canada, billions of investment are going to uh, be allocated to renewable industry. We're looking forward to present a new figure uh, in six months. I'm going to stop here and uh, give this floor to my colleague, Joyce, uh, our head of policy and um, project. She's going to present the key findings from the story side of the report. Over to you, Joyce. Okay, thank you very much, Feng. Uh, so I'm uh, Joyce Lee, Head of Policy and Projects at GWEC. And it's my pleasure to, to be with you all today to introduce five of our top takeaways uh, from the story side of the report, which covers the short and long-term outlook for wind energy globally. 
I'm going to jump right in with number one, which is that we're falling behind for our 2030 milestones for net zero. We all know the world is increasingly moving towards this shared goal of net zero by 2050. We've seen that goal set by the IPCC as a necessity to limit global warming uh, by the UN and the Race to Zero campaign as a framework for climate pledges by state and non-state actors and by international energy authorities like the IEA and IRENA. In 2021, we also saw carbon neutrality go mainstream, so to speak, as a policy target uh, with national net zero targets now covering around 80% uh, of global GDP and around 77% of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. But the net zero discussion remains fairly shallow when you look at the countries with strong targets and clear plans for net zero. Those countries only cover about 10% of global GDP and 5% of emissions worldwide. This policy gap in part explains why wind energy installations are not yet aligned with global net zero targets. At current rates of growth, we're only on track to reach just less than 2,000 gigawatts of cumulative installed capacity by 2030. And that means we're only two thirds, we would be only two thirds of where we need to be to be on track by the end of this decade for a 1.5 degree uh, global warming pathway. That's according to roadmaps released by the IA and IRENA. To get on track, we need annual wind installations to scale up by around four times from that 94 gigawatt mark that we saw last year to around 390 gigawatts by the end of this decade. And by coincidence, we're releasing this report, uh, hopefully on the same day that the IPCC Working Group 3 publishes its findings on climate change mitigation. And this report will agree that the world has a very narrow window now to meet the Paris targets, and will agree on the huge step change in deployment of wind and solar to remain within that, within that window. I think it's looking at a narrow window, it's, it's easy to, to feel pessimistic, but actually it's a reason for optimism because we have the technology, we have the capital, and we have the knowledge about the policy actions needed to, to meet that window. The second takeaway from the report is around the system design and social challenges on the horizon. So we're now facing this urgency to, to rapidly scale deployment of wind. And what we did is apply some analysis uh, in this year's report on the multidimensional challenges to, to the growth of wind. Uh, this analysis is by no means exhaustive uh, and looking at all the factors which impact the industry, but it does distill challenges into six main areas, which are system design, society, supply chain, technology, infrastructure, and workforce. Based on a global survey we performed with global renewable energy associations, we've captured the perspective on the severity of these challenges in six areas. Uh, to wind energy's growth in the short and long term. So you can see the nodes that are closer to the outer circle are considered more severe. And you can see the short term captured in teal and the long term captured in green here. What we found is that the short term and long term challenges tend to converge in the system design and society areas, in addition to grid and infrastructure needs as was addressed in opening remarks. So issues like the social and economic proposition of wind versus coal and gas, uh, market design for pricing and procurement, permitting challenges, social acceptance, the availability of land and seabed. These are all prominent challenge areas for growth. And the report provides numerous recommendations for policymakers in these areas, which can help to implement uh, more suitable market signals and incentives for wind and help to build social consensus on the transition. Uh, I've been cheeky and I snuck in a 2.5 takeaway here, which is a uh, to acknowledge that while these challenges in system design and society are foreseen to be more severe on the horizon, we're already seeing the symptoms of market failures for the energy transition in front of us now. The current global energy crisis has shown the macroeconomic, uh, social and geopolitical vulnerabilities of continued exposure to fossil fuels. We're seeing supply scarcity and trade speculation in fossil fuels lead to sharp increases in wholesale and subsequently retail electricity prices and that's hit consumers hard all over the world. It's also curbed economic productivity. This was already present last year before uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine in China and India where coal supply shortages led to industrial shutdowns and led to power outages and where uh, coal exporters like Indonesia imposed temporary moratoriums on coal exports, which subsequently led to a huge spike in prices. As shown here in this graph of demand and supply shocks for natural gas and coal, uh, we've seen extreme volatility and prices spike by three to five times over the course of last year. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, of course, fossil fuel prices continue to be volatile, 
The price of natural gas in Europe, for example, reached an all-time high last month. This has in turn caused inflation across sectors, especially power intensive ones, and that's expected to remain an elevated issue uh, in both advanced and emerging economies through the, the course of this year. While we have seen these price shocks sharpen the call to shift to indigenous and cost competitive wind and solar, renewable developers remain under intense pressure to continue delivering clean power at increasingly low prices. And fossil fuel generators, meanwhile, are seeing windfall profits. So this kind of perverse situation is failing to incentivize the sufficient volume of investment in wind. And we're seeing that in the lagging capacity of projects available for development, as well as in the way current wholesale power markets are set up where uh, remuneration is based on the marginal costs and the scarcity of fossil fuels. Without action, we believe that the risk of energy insecurity is only going to increase, especially as we're looking at a bumpy road to economic recovery, rising inflation, national debt burdens, and income inequality. We need to note that renewables will continue to beat out fossil fuels on cost, but the report highlights the long-term need to realign electricity markets uh, and pricing with system value rather than costs drawn on, on marginal costs from fossil fuels, and the short-term need to increase the volume of capacity in the pipeline available for wind energy development. Together, we think these actions can help to sustain investment signals for wind. Moving on to the third takeaway, which is that cooperation is needed to confront the geopolitical and supply chain challenges in front of us. The industrial recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and the increasing demand for critical materials has also seen price fluctuations for some of the key cost inputs in the wind supply chain. As shown in these donut graphs here, which break down the materials needed for onshore and offshore wind, steel, for instance, comprises a large share of these materials and in uh, the steel market, we've seen prices go up by 50% from 2020 to the end of 2021, and still further since uh, the invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent sa sanctions on Russia. Copper prices increased 60% over the same period, and the rare earth elements like neodymium and dysprosium, which are required for direct drive and hybrid drive turbines, have uh, those prices have tripled over this period. Freight, freight costs have also soared. The spot rates for a container from Asia to the US, for instance, by the middle of last year were 10 times higher than just a few years prior. As a result, turbine prices are forecast to increase this year. And given turbine capital costs uh, make up around one third for offshore wind capex and up to two thirds for onshore wind capex, this is significantly impacting the cost calculations for wind energy. Securing the supply chain for wind in the future will mean not only revenue stabilization mechanisms for offtake, which can help to smooth out revenue distribution across the value chain, but also new public-private partnerships and innovations, which can help to build strategic stockpiles for critical materials, find alternatives to these materials, identify other geographic sources for them, and then commercialize the recycling stream so we can improve circularity. Coming to our fourth takeaway, We've pointed out some of the critical areas in the medium to long term, and these last uh, takeaways, number four and five, focus on the challenges to resolve now, which can help to accelerate wind energy growth and increase energy security in this current crisis. So the first area is one we've heard uh, a lot about lately, which is to streamline permitting schemes for wind projects. And this has received a lot of attention in the context of the Repowering Europe framework just announced, as well as in the context of last year's uh, Build Back Better schemes, uh, to recover from COVID-19 uh, in, in the form of shovel-ready projects. Too many countries are unable to leverage the enormous interest to invest in wind energy due to overly complex or bureaucratic permitting schemes and delayed permitting procedures, which leaves a surplus of projects stuck in the pipeline. And we've gathered a few examples in the report here. So for instance, offshore wind projects in the US can take more than six years to permit. In Mexico, renewable energy projects can take more than three years to permit. In the UK, only 16 onshore wind turbines were permitted between 2016 and 2020, that's one six. In Europe, Spain, Italy, Greece, Sweden, Belgium, and Croatia, permitting can take more than eight years for onshore wind, including the time required for legal challenges. In Japan, it can take up to eight years to complete the environmental impact assessment. And in Indonesia and Vietnam, permitting is very fractured, spread across multiple government bodies. And in India, the land acquisition alone for wind projects can take up to two years. So what we're trying to show here is that permitting is a universal barrier for wind energy, 
and our report makes nine concrete recommendations to speed this process up. Finally, the last takeaway is that we need to urgently invest uh, in grid, uh, grid integration and grid build out to enable wind growth. Like permitting infrastructure is also a global challenge for renewables, which touches advanced and developing economies. And it covers everything from electricity networks to logistic highways to ports. The future energy system is going to be based on a large share of renewables. It's digitalized, it's decentralized, and it's highly electrified. But this requires the infrastructure planning, the permissions, the investment, as well as the build to support this. In climate policy terms, most NDCs now refer to renewable energy generation, but less than a quarter of NDCs refer to the grid improvements necessary to integrate renewables. And in terms of investment, current global investment in grids is woefully inadequate and even declined for the last few years leading up to 2020 as shown here in this graph. The IA estimates that annual investment in grids needs to scale up by around three times from the roughly 300 billion annual mark to 820 billion by 2030. And this is extremely urgent considering the timeline for transmission projects even exceeds the timeline to build a utility scale renewable project. And that brings me to the end of the takeaways. So I'll just quickly sum up uh, that we need to scale up annual wind installations in four times by this decade. We need to get more volume in the pipeline for development. We need to address the global short and long term challenges regarding system design and society. We need to increase cooperation and uh, innovation to stabilize pricing in the wind supply chain, urgently streamline, streamline permitting for wind projects, and then increase planning and investment in grid infrastructure to enable larger and larger share of renewables. With that, I think we can move to the Q&A section of the webinar. We have about 20 minutes left and a truly global panel lined up. Some of us will be joining uh, you on stage. I'll invite Fung back on stage uh, to, to join Ben here. And we also have colleagues online joining us from Singapore, India, Beijing, and Nairobi. So I think as those colleagues are making their way to the virtual stage, I'll start with a question for for Ben, which is around the current global energy crisis facing us, which is acknowledged by the report and acknowledged by the remarks today. Um, as we look to the urgency needed to stabilize energy supply in the short term and the equally urgent need to mitigate emissions in the short term, how can policymakers act with regards to wind energy as a response to this crisis, looking at these two, two needs together? Thank you, uh, Joyce. Um, I mean, in, in short, um, I think the answer is, you know, let investment flow. And I think everybody wants um, you know, more investment. It's, it's, a, it's an economic opportunity um, as well for, for countries, um, you know, around the world. Um, I mean, I, I agree with um, Javier Viteri's uh, comments um, earlier. This is not about making you know, rash or kind of ill-fought, uh, you know, short-term changes. It's about how do we unlock uh, more investment? Um, and I think some of the solutions um, um, are, you know, can actually be quite simple. I mean, permitting is one very, very easy uh, win, which can unlock a lot of projects which are already in the pipeline. Um, I think more predictability around um, um, auctioning um, and having you know, visibility over what's coming in the pipeline um, um, is another. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I think um, you know, those things can be done um, uh, fairly uh, quickly. Um, I won't say easily, but I think they're, they're possible. But they, they really require um, uh, you know, a collaborative approach uh, between government, between industry, between investors and, and with communities. But I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very confident that these things uh, can be done. And um, I think what's, what's required now is to get around the table um, and, and work on these things with, with a fair degree of, of um, urgency. Thanks very much, Ben. Turning to another dimension of the crisis, which is the supply chain. Uh, over to you, Fung. As, as we spoke about, the supply chain has been deeply impacted over the last year, not just by the crisis, but also the, the inflation around commodities and freight and, and the lockdowns for, from COVID-19. So what's the outlook for the year ahead in terms of the, the state of the health of the supply chain? Uh, second for a question, Jess. Uh, regarding the supply chain, as I 
uh, already mentioned during my presentation, I think uh, it is incredible to see how much the industry can put together uh, during the challenging time. Uh, even though it's the second year, but uh, in terms of China, actually, we see the level of China increase instead of downgrades. Um, due to many stuff from the second uh, half of 2021, as we can see, we also mentioned that in the report, uh, we call increase of the steel price and also copper. Uh, if you're looking at the logistic, uh, the freight costs actually increase eight to 10 percent, uh, 10 times as much as uh, you know, the previous year. This uh, bring the extra costs and also you have COVID restriction. You have, you need to mobilize extra team um, to uh, get the project uh, executed. Uh, that's why we see uh, the majority of the turbine OEM on the industry stock this company report the, you know, in many cases, actually it's a negative EBIT. Uh, that's uh, the same situation across the global. Looking at uh, this year, um, 2022, uh, we hope we can manage and adopt and copy the crisis better than the previous year. But looking at where we are today, for example, Shanghai is still locked down. And there is a concern from the European supply chain. I spoke with uh, a couple of uh, leading turbine OEM last week. Uh, they are even thinking about the potential you know, alternative because they don't know, you know what's going to happen uh, if this virus is out of control in China, because uh, you know, close the, uh, along the east coast near Shanghai, Jiangsu, Zhejiang, they are the key global component and material manufacturing hubs for China, for renewable in general. If something goes around there, I think we're going to have uh, some um, impact in terms of new installation, but uh, finger crossed. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fang. Uh, I'm going to invite you to switch spots now with Ramon Fiesta, our, our chair of the Latin America Task Force, uh, who can shortly take questions on Latin America. But in the meantime, I will turn to some of our virtual panelists from around the world. Uh, we do have a question on Southeast Asia. So I'm going to address this to our head of Asia, uh, Li Ming Tiao. And I, I think in the current crisis, we've seen a lot of discussion on, on gas and now a lot of concern around countries looking to coal as a short-term measure, um, either by increasing coal generation, uh, stockpiling coal, or maybe uh, prolonging coal plant lifetimes. Li Ming, uh, what are the prospects for wind energy in Southeast Asian countries, which are coal dependent or their key coal exporters? Over to you. I, thanks, Joy. So I think that's a brilliant question, especially in the current crisis where we've seen record high um, coal and gas price in, in the world. And I think that really sent a very strong signal to all the governments in the region, which are heavily rely on the coal and gas imports, few imports, that this cannot be continued and, 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 and the ready and really like um, resources is renewable energy. And actually, I think what has happened in the past year in the Southeast Asia region also kind of give a confirmation to this messaging. If we look at what happened in Vietnam last year, it's truly remarkable. And it's, um, it has 2.7 gigawatt of onshore installation that bring the country for the first time into the global top 10 onshore installation list and 779 megawatt of offshore installation, which you may argue that's mainly uh, intertidal, it's not real and true offshore, but it still bring the, the country into the top 10, top 10 offshore list, uh, ranking number three uh, in terms of new installation. That's truly, truly remarkable and record breaking in that this is the first time we've seen any country in Southeast Asia enter into this uh, top 10 list and also actually leading right after China, the, the rest of the Asia Pacific and one may argue that, okay, this is because the FIT was like coming to an end last year that's driven all this installation, but still that truly show the potential and show what shows what, what, what this country can do and really have, uh, have lots of like implications to the region um, in Southeast Asia, where traditionally Southeast Asia has always been criticized as the last region, which hasn't really embraced the energy, uh, energy transition as a concept. 
and and I think what happened and what we've seen in Vietnam really proved that everybody's kind of like um, opinion on Southeast Asia is wrong. Uh, what is more is actually this year and end of last year we've seen the governments of Vietnam's um, commitment to, to net zero really truly translate into very concrete action on how they are coming up with the power development plan with very ambitious target being put onto the table. Just to look at the offshore wind, for example, offshore wind target has increased from merely two gigawatt before the uh, net zero target was committed to, to four to five gigawatt towards the end of last year after the commitment was made to seven to eight gigawatts just a few weeks ago. The PDP-8 is still not finalized yet, but we've seen this kind of like increase on the offshore wind target just happening, driven by the commitment of net zero. And this is Vietnam. And, and we've also seen similar things happening just in the second half of last year and beginning of this year in the region. Thailand is now having a 500 megawatts per year kind of um, wind target uh, in, the PDP, in the PDP, and which will last for three years, which will basically drive the, uh, the, the country's dormant wind energy market for four to five years in, into, into some new life. And same is happening in the Philippines, where we've, we are seeing the green energy auction taking place for the first time this year, um, where the wind target is only like the wind allocation is only 380, not 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 that much, but but anyway, it's kicking start to this wind market again, um, which which has been dormant for now for like four to five years by far. So we've seen like movements happening, and we've seen that the energy crisis that is happening right now is basically giving more impetus to the to the regional development. Back to you, Joyce. Asia then. Let's, let's stay with Asia for a moment. I'm seeing a, a few questions on uh, Chinese supply chain um, and the impact from COVID. So maybe over to my colleague, uh, Wang Liang Yang, who's based in Beijing, uh, to tell us about how the current lockdowns in Eastern China along the coast are impacting exports and component availability uh, for the supply chain locally and, and how this impacts the supply chain globally as well. Um. Thank you, Joyce. Um, yes, um, actually the impact of COVID on China's uh, wind industry during the past two years has been limited. Um, and uh, we know that uh, the supply chain uh, uh, of the Chinese wind industry is basically uh, localized. So, it's kind of a kind of a side of a uh, uh, supply system. Uh, so that's why we have uh, very good installations uh, in the past two years. Um, but recently we, uh, there have been some uh, uh, new situation of the Omicron uh, virus that uh, uh, it's uh, sp spreading much more uh, quickly uh, than other uh, you know, previous version. Uh, so now is kind of a critical time for for China how to handle the situation. So we we also follow the situation very closely, uh, on, like for example the Shanghai. Uh, but uh, uh, but the, the import and the export of, of, of China has not been uh, uh, impact uh, from the this uh, pandemic. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the uh, uh, volume of the China's uh, import export uh, of last year has been it has been uh, growth uh, a lot. So uh, so uh, traveling has not been back to normal, uh, but uh, the transportation of goods it's uh, there, there has been very limited impact, uh, and uh, I can see that some. Audience ask that uh, the, the, the you know uh, how much the uh, how how important the China China's uh, supply chain uh, in wind industry. Um, yes, uh, we we have done some research in the past two years that the uh, weight of uh, China's uh, uh, component supplying is getting uh, kind of uh, bigger and bigger in 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 the global market. So. Uh, to the Chinese uh, components uh, suppliers also supplying some international uh, customers. 
uh, besides Ch Chinese local customers. But uh, uh, we, we should remember that, uh, we should know that uh, some, some international uh, turbine manufacturers also have uh, factories in China. So still this kind of uh, supplying is uh, happen in, 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 the, in the country. Um, but uh, uh, for, for, uh, for, the, uh, for the future, uh, that we we believe that uh, uh, there will be, um, there will be more export uh, to global market from China and also um, the government is also encouraging the industry to go to overseas market. Thank you, Joyce. Thanks, Wang Liang. I'm, I'm sure that will be a, a big topic of discussion this year. Um, let's round out our tour of Asia by turning to our colleague uh, in Delhi. Martin Shardul, who's the head of policy of GWEC India. Uh, the wind industry in India had a bit of a tougher year in 2021, due largely to the pandemic restrictions and, and delayed installations. I think around 1.5 gigawatts in total on, onshore wind were installed, just a bit higher than 2020. Power demand has, has since surged since uh, these restrictions have eased. So how, how does the outlook for onshore wind in India look like now? And, are we going to see a, a higher growth level restored to India? Martin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joyce. And uh, uh, let me first of all congratulate everyone for this wonderful report. Uh, and I'm really glad to sh share here with our uh, colleagues that uh, India has been undertaking proactive steps uh, during the COVID times. Uh, for example, the electricity renewable energy sector was included in essential services. So while uh, the country faced immense challenges during the lockdown and then during the various waves of uh, COVID-19, uh, but proactive support from the ministry has helped in uh, curtailing some of the challenges. Uh, there were also some of the uh, policy interventions that uh, came. Uh, and for example, there was a, a ISTS waiver that was extend, extended until 2025. So these uh, promising and uh, enabling policy interventions have really uh, boosted enthusiasm of, uh, uh, of uh, wind sector players in the country. And uh, like you rightly mentioned that um, uh, even though in uh, 2020, we could only add around 1.1 gigawatt in 2021, even uh, after these uh, challenges that the country was facing during COVID-19, we could add around 1.4 gigawatt. And let me uh, be very uh, candid that uh, uh, for several years, India has not been able to cross the 2.5 gigawatt uh, benchmark. Um, but uh, uh, we see that uh, there is uh, light uh, ahead of us and a ray of hope. And we are very optimistic that this year and in the coming years, we will be able to cross that uh, uh, that uh, benchmark of 2.5 and maybe we will be able to cross three and even more uh, capacity that will be added uh, on an annual basis in the yes this is more because there are several projects that are in pipeline and which are expected to uh, get commissioned in this year and in the coming year uh, also uh, uh, let me also mention that uh, from, from the honorable minister's office uh, there is a cons constant follow up uh, the government has taken up a proactive step wherein uh, uh, an institution has been set up uh, within the ministry of commerce uh, with support from the invest india uh, wherein continuous monitoring of infrastructure projects, including renewable energy projects, has been introduced. And uh, we are hopeful that uh, some of the uh, important challenges, some of the legacy challenges which uh, wind energy projects have been facing will be, uh, will be curtailed in the coming months and coming years. We are also very thankful to the ministry uh, for uh, in, uh, introducing new uh, policy interventions. For example, uh, uh, Green Day Ahead, uh, market and green term ahead mar market. The government is also working on uh, a policy intervention that will allow for green open energy access. So we see that a series of enabling uh, policy instruments are in, in pipeline. Some of them have already been introduced. The government has also introduced uh, a very strong uh, and robust mechanism for dispute resolution at the central level, which uh, is likely to be replicated at the state levels. So some of the issues, sorry. So some of the issues that we have been facing regarding uh, legacy challenges, for example, related to uh, permits, uh, relate, related to payments. So we, we, we are hopeful that as these in institutions come into place, we will be able to uh, uh, curtail and we will be able to contain some of the uh, massive challenges which wind sector in India is facing. But uh, but we see that uh, there is uh, a good hope and there are uh, good volumes that are going to come online. 
uh, we are also hopeful that uh, as the government is uh, has already committed for net zero targets by 2070, there is a more push towards uh, reliability and uh, balancing of the grid where wind energy is going to play a very critical role, a very pivotal role. And uh, we are already seeing that innovative auctions, for example, around the clock, bended, uh, have already been uh, uh, undertaken. We, we are hopeful that more number of hybrid projects will uh, come. And, uh, uh, and, and we are just optimistic. Uh, India continues to be uh, world's fourth leader uh, uh, fourth ranked, it, it is ranked fourth in terms of onshore uh, wind ins installations. Thank you, Joyce. Thanks so much, Marta. And I think we need another hour just to unpack the India wind market alone, but we will be publishing uh, an India wind outlook report in the first half of this year, along with uh, Mech Intelligence in India. So please keep an eye out for that if India is an area of focus for you. Uh, I do want to give uh, a few minutes as well. I know we're almost at the end of our time, but uh, a few minutes to uh, Ramon Fiestas, the chair of our Latin America task force, uh, who is joining us on stage. And um, Ramon, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, some Latin America markets. We know Brazil had a brilliant 2021, the third largest growth market for onshore wind globally with 3.8 gigawatts and a new offshore wind framework announced. Um, what are your comments there, as well as uh, some other of the key markets to watch in the Latin America region? Thank you, George. Thank you, George. Yeah, uh, th this was another great year for wind power in Latin America. This is a record year again with uh, close to 5.8 uh, gigawatts. And uh, yes, you mentioned Brazil is this year the rising star again. So normally Brazil uh, is used to be 50% of wind power market in Latin America. But this year is close to 70% of the of the Latin America market, so of the regional market, with close to four gigawatts of installed capacity. This is this is uh, quite close to double what they have done last year. So uh, it is an astonishing market. It's a very healthy market, and I would say that the driver of of this growth is clearly behind the economic growth and the electricity demand growth in, in the country. And I would say close all over the countries in, in, in the region. Um, another market to highlight uh, would be uh, Chile. Chile is a small market, but it's a very healthy market. Uh, Chile is uh, becoming a very, very stable market uh, across the past years, I would say four or five years. And um, we are foreseeing as well a stable growth for the future for the next five years uh, due to his uh, really strong commitments with um, decarbonization and uh, energy transition. Uh, Chile has adopted a very sound policies in order to uh, avoid um, coal fire plants in the next five years. And this is something that is uh, driving uh, really renewable energy growth in, in the market. And, and uh, in that sense, uh, wind power is the second largest uh, renewable energy uh, source in, in the country, uh, but probably will be the first one in the next years due to the, um, the um, composition of the electricity markets there with the two big markets in the North and the South and the, um, um, more capabilities or more better characteristics for supplying the electricity market in, in Chile by wind power in the next years. Um, there is a promising market as well uh, called Colombia. Colombia is preparing in Latin America very sound uh, energy policies regarding uh, as well energy transition and decarbonization. In that sense, much more related to um, trying to achieve a resilience uh, electricity matrix rather than um, decarbonize as, as uh, Colombia has a uh, very large uh, hydro uh, electric resources. And, uh, but they understood that the path of renewable energies is, is um, absolutely there to be there and, 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 and to, to, to drive the country's growth in the future. And, uh, we, we are uh, realizing very uh, rapid, very uh, fast um, 
policy improvements, uh, not only uh, due to the, um, due to the um, uh, recent auctions that are uh, increasing the pipeline for uh, wind power projects, but also uh, regarding uh, the, the good understanding of energy transition uh, in terms of um, preparing the electricity system for a, for, a, for a more larger electrification in the future. So uh, I think uh, it's a, really a market to watch uh, for the future. And the black sheet is again, um, Mexico. We are really uh, worried about what is happening uh, there in the last uh, three years. Uh, there is a clear decoupling of the energy policy, what we have seen in the past. Um, this energy policy is not only, um, not only uh, decoupling from renewable energies, but also for private investments. This is probably a sounder problem than only energy investments. And uh, now we are uh, in the verge of uh, really very uh, relevant political and judicial decisions that uh, may drive the country in one side or in one direction or in, in, in the other direction. So um, we still feel or, and, and, and believe in the Mexican market as one of the most relevant markets in, in the region because of the economic growth and the electricity demand growth. And uh, of course the uh, partnership or the close relationship with the North American markets. And in that sense, uh, Mexico uh, is becoming or will become a, a very uh, large uh, market for renewable energies, but we need to have patience and to see what is going to happen in the next, uh, very next future with these political decisions. And I would say this is probably the most uh, relevant uh, facts there. Argentina is also trying to find uh, really uh, another way to recover the path uh, that has um, driven the past um, years in, 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 in renewable energy expansion, especially in, in, in wind power developments. And probably it's going to take some time, but we see some some uh, positive signals at the at the private market, at the private market, and this is uh, now um, driving the small growth that we are seeing in Argentina. But we believe that uh, this can be that can become in the future again a, a robust market and, and a very healthy one. So this is my conclusions, Joyce. Thank you so much, Ramon, for that uh, whirlwind tour of Latin America. Um, I, I think we're out of time, I, and I'm afraid we, we haven't been able to touch on Africa and the Middle East. I, I encourage anyone with questions on uh, these regions to please get in touch with GWEC, including the director of our Africa Wind Power Initiative, Wangari Muchiri, based in Kenya. Um, with that, I think we've had 10 takeaways, uh, more than six speakers. There's far too much to unpack here. Uh, to, to really do justice to what's in the Global Wind Report. So I just, um, I'll, I'll end my time on stage with encouraging everyone to please visit the GWEC website, download the report and uh, get in touch with us to continue this conversation um, because there's a lot of work that we need to do uh, in the decade ahead. So I'm going to hand it now to back to Stuart to close the webinar. Thank you, Joyce. And uh, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, as Joe's mentioned, we do have, we have covered a lot of ground today. Uh, we are going to do some deep dives over the next three days. So GWIC is hosting the Global Market Theatre in Bilbao, at Wind Europe in Bilbao, where we'll be touching on tomorrow, we'll be looking at the US, Latin America, and a special session on the Ukraine. Uh, on uh, Wednesday, we've got an a APAC focus where we did look at China, the APAC and Korea. Then in the afternoons, we'll be going into, the, into Europe. And uh, on Thursday, we've got uh, what we're, we're actually having a look at what we're going to be doing at COP27 this year. Uh, we'll be looking at combating disinformation and focusing on uh, oceans and also our Africa uh, activities. So as Joyce said, please pick up a copy of the report. Uh, if you're actually in Bilbao, we've printed uh, the first hundred people to pass our stand can actually pick up a, a very freshly minted copy of the report 
it's a fascinating read. It's uh, take it home. It's one of the, these documents that uh, hopefully will be a seminal piece of literature here in, uh, the, for the wind industry moving forward. It's really been a lot of blood, sweat and tears and a lot of people that have gone into peer reviewing and a lot of people behind the scenes that have put their, uh, a lot of effort into this. Finally, once again, I'd like to thank Iba Jorla, in particular Xavier, for the generous use of or generous uh, giving of your time, plus the uh, theatre today. And so we look forward to seeing you all at the US session tomorrow around about 12.